Okay, I hope you had a nice uh, meal. Um, the next talk is about functional design patterns by uh, Franz Thoma, <coughs> who is a software de developer at TMG Technology Consulting. Yes, enjoy the talk. Thank you. So, yes, today I'm, uh, I'm going to talk about functional design patterns. We're going to start with, uh, the, questions, with the question, are there uh, design patterns in functional programming anyway? So, uh, that's, that's the first question. And then, uh, uh, in order to answer that, we have to, to go back and ask, what is a design pattern uh, at all? Um, and after we estab establish that, we're going to see that there are actually design patterns in functional programming, and uh, I'm going to do to show you a few examples for uh, for yeah patterns uh, that we can use in uh, functional programming that are maybe not there in in other programming parad paradigms, and maybe even are very language specific, but uh, that actually there are patterns in uh, that we can use in functional programming. So to the question whether there are uh, design patterns in functional programming. Um, there are questions, uh, for example, on Reddit that pop up regularly, like uh, how do you implement common design patterns in Haskell, like repository, factory, inversion of control? Um, these or similar questions pop up regularly. Uh, others like how, how does one design a large-scale application? So that's that's more down to the ground. I mean, most of the, the patterns we know from object-oriented programming are for structuring an application, are uh, a, a repeatable, reproducible way to um, to to have a consistent structure for your for your application. Um, but most of those actually don't translate to uh, to functional programming right away. Uh, for example, factories. Do we have factories in, in uh, Haskell, for example? Probably not. Um, so a lot of answers uh, go along the lines, for example, uh, functional programming has fewer design patterns and more libraries. That is true. We, uh, we have, in Haskell, we have m much more powerful, uh, much more powerful language, and um, this means that probably a lot of things that have to be expressed in a pattern in object-oriented languages can be expressed in a library with an easily implemented interface or type class in, uh, in Haskell. Um, other answers are along the lines of types. Everything starts from types. Uh, so we've, uh, we've had the talk by, by uh, Edwin before lunch, uh, type-driven development. And, uh, also in Haskell, we do a lot of work starting from types and uh, um, and work our way from our, our way from there. Uh, but all those answers are, are not really helpful uh, for for the for the actual questions whether there are design patterns or not because uh, they touch a they touch a different. Um, uh, to, uh, they, they, they touch a different uh, realm of, uh, of the problem. Just because you have types doesn't mean, uh, or you, you usually start working from types, or you have a lot of uh, libraries, doesn't mean there are no design patterns. Um, so, and a question I also often get asked, uh, because uh, in my company, most of the people are uh, work actually with, uh, sorry, somehow my, my speaker view, tends to skip one slide. That's bad. <laughs> so, um, there are other answers to this question. For example, uh, Gabriel has, has his blog, um, Haskell for All, and he uh, talks about the functor design pattern, or the category design pattern. Um, and functors are kind of first level citizens uh, in, in Haskell or other uh, functional languages. So. Um, can we really call that a design pattern? <clears throat> Another question that's, uh, that's, so I work in a company with mostly object-oriented people, uh, or people who are used to object-oriented pro programming. So uh, a common question is, how do you mock things in Haskell? Do you even mock, th mock things? Um, actually, 
usually you, you really don't, or uh, or at least uh, that's that's my experience. Um, but why? Is it because we uh, we don't have the need for it because we everything is pure functions, so we don't need to 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 mock any external behavior, or is it because we are not used to structuring our uh, application accordingly so that we can use mocking? And a similar question question: How do you do dependency injection in Haskell? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a huge thing in uh, in, uh, in in Java Spring Framework, for example, um, but. Do we have have something like this in, in Haskell? Well, is do don't we have it because it's not necessary, or because we haven't found a way a, a, a principled way to do it that can be formulated formulated as a design pattern? So let's go back a bit and ask the question: What is a design pattern anyway? Um, probably the most uh, most popular book um, is the the, this part of the book Design Patterns. It's also uh, known as Gang of Four. I think it's from 1996, 97, something like that. So it's quite old, and it yeah it describes elements of reusable object-oriented software. So it's clear we're in the in the object-oriented realm. And there we have patterns like uh, like factory builder, uh, iterator, you name it. Actually, this book, Gang, the, the Gang of Four book, uh, doesn't even really define the, the, uh, the term design pattern. It just draws an analogy to, to architecture, so not software architecture, uh, architecture, but architecture of buildings, where you have patterns uh, that, that are repeated over and over again. For, uh, so you have recognizable design in, in buildings, but it doesn't really define the term. So let's go to Wikipedia actually. Um, <clears throat> and well, we have a reusable solution, that's probably clear. Uh, what's important, it is not a finished design. Um, it is a description or a template how to solve a problem that can be used in different situations, but it's not finished. You can't, it's not something you can directly give as a piece of code or as a library or uh, or maybe even as a language feature but it's it's something that has to be described outside of code so that's for example for the functor design pattern we we just uh, uh, mentioned in Haskell functor isn't actually a design pattern because it's already there it's in code it's a it's a standard library interface similarly um, Gang of Four describes the iterator pattern. So let's ask the question, is iterator a pattern in, in Java? It's listed in Gang of Four as a pattern, but in the, in the Java standard library, we actually have, we have interfaces, iterable and iterator. Um, we have a lot of standard library uh, collections that implement this, uh, this interface. And if I want to write my own iterable, I don't have to uh, have to to reinvent that pattern. I don't have to to follow instructions from outside the code. I just have this interface. I implement the methods and then I'm done. So, and there is even syntactic sugar for for uh, iterables. So it's really baked into the language, which means in in Java, really iterator isn't a design pattern, although. Uh, in, uh, in Gang of Four, in general, it might be a pattern in lang for languages that, that don't support this kind, of, uh, this kind of interface. And so let's go to a working definition. It's along the lines of, uh, of the Wikipedia definition. Uh, we have a reusable solution. Reusable is important for a recurring problem. Um, that can be given in terms of, an, of a recipe but not as a reusable piece of code. Um, and hopefully with, uh, with this definition we, we can work. Actually, uh, this, um, so this means also it really depends on the language you're using, whether something is a design pattern or not. This is also something that's actually acknowledged in Gang of Four. Um, if, you, if you have a language that doesn't uh, um, 
that doesn't support inheritance, then maybe you, ha you would have a pattern called inheritance. Uh, or the visitor pattern is something you need in many object-oriented languages, but there are other languages that actually have the feature um, like pattern matching, or they call it multi-methods, uh, right, uh, have, have that feature baked right in, so you don't need an, um, an additional, you, you don't need it as a pattern. <clears throat> so it, it depends on the language and the paradigm. Uh, so let's, let's have a look at another pattern that probably, as, as Haskell developers, we are very familiar with. That's the monad. Monad is a, uh, so monads have grown kind of popular in the, in the Java world. We have uh, optionals since, since Guava, since probably the 2000, 2010, something like that. We have futures, uh, we have streams in Java 8, and all of them uh, offer a method called flatmap. And uh, the structure of flatmap is always the same, but we don't have a generic interface for flat mappable or monad we, uh, we can implement in Java. So it's actually a pattern, a design pattern. You can call it the, the monad pattern or whatever you like, but having that, uh, that method flat map on an object that has a single, uh, that has a type parameter and it takes a function that, uh, that uh, is used in a, in a certain way, well, you, you ha somehow have to describe how to implement a flat map function how to write a flat map function because it's not it's not an interface that's there in Haskell well just write instances right so not a design pattern <coughs> um, so in basically why do we have design patterns because there are we we have a feature missing from uh, from the language we are using, and if you uh, if we take um, functional programming, then lots of the well-known object-oriented patterns are s simply not necessary because you have the for example the strategy pattern in, in OOP that's higher order functions, so you don't actually need the strategy pattern. Um, we have the visitor pattern. Uh, in functional programming, we just have pattern matching. So, why do we need a visitor? It's simply, simply not applicable. Uh, similarly, sim singletons. Uh, when when you have objects that have uh, classes that have arbitrary number of instances, then you have to work really hard to have something that has only a single instance. If you have top level constants, why bother? So, an approach to to functional design patterns or design patterns in functional programming is to look for features that are missing from uh, from functional languages that are present in, in in OLP and so for example subtyping is something that we usually don't have in purely functional languages uh, so if you if we have a uh, Hindley Milner type system probably with uh, some uh, extensions then still we don't have subtyping. Uh, actually, there is a pattern. I've seen a pattern for that. Uh, it's, for example, it's used in the um, in the optics library from WellTyped, and I, I don't know whether it has a name yet. Anders, maybe you know, uh, maybe you know a name for it. But so, uh, but it's it's clearly a design pattern. How to model subtyping in a language that doesn't uh, uh, support subtyping right away. Um, or maybe we want uh, to have something like classes and instances and also th uh, for that there's a pattern in, in uh, yeah. so we have a pattern that we can use in Haskell or other languages in order to emulate um, classes, interfaces and instances so if we, if we really want this kind of feature then we can uh, emulate it but we don't have it right in our languages in our language so yeah, when we talk about um, functional patterns, then really we have to talk about two different groups of patterns. One is uh, patterns that come from functional programming and are implemented in a, in a non-functional language. Uh, like for example, uh, the visitor pattern is a, a feature from 
uh, from uh, Henry Milner basically, and it's uh, emulated in uh, in OOP or like the Monad pattern that is uh, that's just a library interface in in Pascal and uh, requires a pattern in in Java, for example. That's one group, and the other group is uh, native functional patterns. So pa patterns that are there in uh, in functional languages because they are not uh, because there there are features missing from the language. And I'm going to talk about the latter. Uh, so the rest of the talk will be well examples for functional patterns and. I'm going to start with a quite simple pattern. Um, so the, the config monoid. Uh, I've seen it, for example, in the uh, in the source code of uh, Stack, so the, the Haskell build tool, or one of the Haskell build tools, uh, where you have the, the the partial options monoid or config monoid, and it's used to to merge options from from different sources with a given precedence. So you have, for example, a config file, you have default options, you have options from the command line, maybe, maybe environment variables or, uh, or others, and you, you want to, to have a precedence between those, so the, the, the options from the command line, for example, override the options from the, from the config file, but uh, all of them may have options missing, so uh, maybe there is no default for, for an option and you have to specify it on the command line. Um, and so that's, that's a pattern. So for, for each, <coughs> for, each for, for the data type options, uh, there you, have, you want to have every property fixed. You don't want any, uh, any ambiguity. So for example, the verbose flag is required. You want to know whether, whether, whether uh, verbose is on or off. And others are probably um, optional, but still you want to you want to have a precedence between uh, between different. Uh, so you want to, you want to have the possibility to override uh, things. So and in order to do that, you have uh, you, you have another algebraic data type that's that has exactly the same structure, uh, but it's a monoid. It has Every every field is uh, additionally wrapped in a last uh, in the last monoid, <coughs> and this allows you. So, uh, you, you, of course, at some point you have to translate between those two. So you take partial options and you get back options. So the real deal, uh, but you you have to validate for, for first, of course. So if uh, some properties are missing from the uh, from the partial options, then uh, the validation fails, but if everything is okay, everything that's required is there, uh, then you get back the options. And for for uh, the cache timeout, for, for example, it's pretty easy. Just get last. If, if, if it's been defined somewhere, then you get the last, uh, the, the, the value with the highest precedence. And if, if it wasn't defined, then well, you still have a maybe here. In case of the verbose flag, it's a bit uh, it's not so simple. There we have the possibility of failure because maybe the flag was given nowhere. Then we have to to uh, to throw an error, or we we've defined it somewhere and then well we're okay. So that's the way to convert uh, partial options into options, and from a client. Uh, from client code, you simply fetch all the all the options from from all different uh, providers. So you have a config file, you have command line, you maybe have a, uh, you have maybe have environment variables. You uh, you just fetch all the options, uh, mapend them. So that's the step where where precedence is implemented, and then you you just convert it to. Uh, To the actual options. This is uh, coincidentally uh, 
we had the, the question before, how, do you, how, how is a builder implemented in Haskell? It's very similar. Sim uh, builders are, uh, are implemented in Haskell with a monoid, with a partial monoid that, uh, that is, and the build step is basically converting the monoid into the, the, the data type you're actually, you, you actually want to build. <coughs> so, for, sorry, yeah, um, and there is a, so this pattern is actually described uh, in, a, in a blog post, and uh, yeah, as I said, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the stack source code, for example, it's, it's, it's used very heavily, so they ha have a deep hierarchy of uh, <coughs> config monoid, or op uh, options monoids. So, um, Moving on to, uh, so this, this was a pattern that's uh, pretty confined to, to one, sp uh, to, uh, to, uh, so it's uh, more like a behavioral pattern. Um, how about patterns for structuring your, up your entire application? So one of the first patterns I learned uh, is the transformer stack. And why do we need that? Uh, basically in, in Haskell, Every, every kind of side effect is uh, modeled as a monad. So you have the I.O. monad that allows you to interact with the outside world, you have the state monad that allows you to uh, keep uh, a local pure state, you have the reader to, uh, to fetch something uh, out of a shared environment, um, you have the uh, accept monad or either for handling arrows and so on. Um, and so uh, monads usually don't, uh, or not usually, they, they don't compose in general. Monads don't, don't compose. So you have, to have a, you have to find a way how to make monads compose in an ad hoc way. They, uh, you can't just compose them generically, but you can compose a certain monad with, an, with another monad. Um, but you have to, to implement it, actually. Uh, and that's what uh, mono transformers are for. So a mono transformer is in, uh, is something that adds the effect of one monad to another monad. And in order to to manage kind of multiple uh, side effects that uh, that an, an application might perform, we have the transformer stack, and uh, that's actually a frequently used pattern for uh, for structuring the the. I/O layer, or n not I/O, but uh, well, the application state basically. Um, so we start with a with a type. It's a, a new type that's an app transformer. So the T is always uh, always stands for transformer. And uh, as we as you can see, we have state here. We have a reader for configuration, and we have a base monad. So the transformer stack is is a transformer itself and it accepts a base model for extensibility um, and so the deriving is pretty simple at least in, in modern GHC where you can de derive a lot of things uh, just just uh, by using the deriving keyword and then we we need a monotrans instance so we make it a monotransformer itself um, we have, usually you have another type, that's the app without a transformer, that's just using identity as a base monad, so a monad that doesn't really do anything, uh, because you, uh, you maybe want to have pure, uh, pure effects. So you can, uh, this is for using IO for example. You can, you can plug IO as a base monad and then you can do IO in this transformer stack. If you don't want to do anything else, but those two effects, uh, then you use I and you use identity and have kind of this pure effect. Um, yes, and from that you can build on and write convenience methods. For example, in order to retrieve the configuration, you have to ask. That's from the that's from the reader, um, but you have to lift it because the reader is uh, deep down in the stack. The uppermost level is the state, so you have to lift it once. The app state uh, is retrieved via get, 
and you don't have to lift that because it's already uh, at the top of the stack. So for each level you, you add uh, at the bottom of the stack, you have to lift once more. <coughs> no, uh, so that, no, that's why it makes sense to, to have those convenience methods. And uh, with those, you, you actually interact with the transformer stack. And as a client, well, you can you basically wrap all the effects of your application with the app transformer. And uh, so, for example, for handling an event, you probably want you don't want to do I/O. You you only want to kind of modify the state. So, uh, handle event is uh, is a pure uh, transformer, uh, a pure stack. And for rendering the application, you probably want to do I/O. So uh, there you have. Um, there you have I/O as the base monad, and that's how you can uh, render the entire application. <clears throat> and you can also scope. So we uh, we left this uh, state as a parameter, as a type parameter, in order that you can uh, you can also scope down into the state. You can have the state of a single button, and this uh, and and have a another function for rendering just this uh, this button based on the button state. <clears throat> so, yes, the so one one downside of the transformer stack, um, or so, so the, the transformer stack is quite an quite an older pattern uh, for for managing side effects. There are more modern solutions like uh, effects. Uh, there's different kinds of effects libraries that maybe compose better than uh, than mono transformers, but still it's. It's still really popular, um, but it has the the transformer stack has also one downside. Um, it tends to make applications really really monolithic, because you see here uh, the basically you always have the uh, have the state side effect available. You always have the configuration reading side side effect available. If you add more things to the stack, like uh, exception handling or logging or whatever, then you have always have those kinds of capabilities, and you can't escape them. You can't really say, "Well, in this function, I really want to be as pure as possible and only read from the environment, but don't, uh, but not change any state." And so this is this is good for for like the the topmost uh, layer of the I/O layer of the application, but Going on from there, it's probably better to to have more fine grained control, and for for this task we have a we have another pattern, um, the service pattern, or uh, I think it's also being called the handle pattern, and the purpose of this pattern is uh, to to have components that can be easily exchanged. Um, so it's basically the, the the goal is to have inversion of control. And a concept that we know from uh, object-oriented programming, and uh, we want to do inversion of control in order to be able to uh, switch uh, implementations, for example, mock implementations, or we uh, we want to reuse uh, components that are used by other components, and so that's that's really for the also for the I/O layer of an of an application, and. Um, so this service pattern looks like this. We start with a, in the example, we, we have a logger, a logger, logging service. And this logging service is modeled as an as a ADT that has, uh, has functions as fields. And all those functions work, on, uh, work in I.O. in this case. They might work in another monad. And so when we talk about this uh, this data type as an object-oriented interface, then uh, those functions may be our methods we are declaring. But we don't give any implementations. We just have have the type type signatures, and then we give several implementations. So uh, values of this uh, of this logger data type. For example, we could have a no op logger, a logger that doesn't do anything. So it ignores the, it just ignores its, ar its arguments. And we also could write to the console. So we have a, we print the, the message to uh, to the console, 
and we of course we only want to do that when the log level is uh, the, the given log level is higher than the threshold and we can do a similar thing with a file and we can think of all kinds of implementations for this uh, for this logging functions and hence uh, 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 values of this logger data type and with uh, some some added convenience like uh, we have if I have a logger available then I can log error log warn and so on um, we can use this in, in client code for example well So this this uh, is, has just a monad reader logger. So we have access to a logger. We have this, the logging service some, somehow in scope, and then we just can log info. Uh, uh, the countdown can uh, lift I/O, other I/O actions, and log info again. And. <coughs> And now maybe we want to test uh, this this function, so we simple simply can uh, come up with a mock, a mock implementation that collects all the uh, all the log messages. So here we have a we have an I/O ref where we collect the, the log messages instead of printing it uh, printing them somewhere, and then return it afterwards. So that's that's the thing we could use for testing. So when we go back to uh, what uh, to, to the question we had in the, in the beginning, how do you mock things in Haskell? That's how you mock things in Haskell. And now you have you maybe have a application that's a bit more com complex. You have additional. Uh, you have more than one service. You have multiple services that maybe depend on each other. For example, you have a da database service that also wants to log, right? Um, and you have uh, the, the managed mono, and inside this managed mono, you can just create, well, uh, create instances of one service and another service, pass, pass service handles to other services, and basically, this is how do you, how do you dependency injection in Haskell. So, and that is also the end of my talk. Finished quite early. Yes, thank you again. Um, then, when we have uh, enough time, we'll have questions or discussion, open discussion about the topic. Feel free. Yes? Um, are there any other good alternatives to Mona transformers? Um, there are a lot. Um, I don't know how widely they, they are used already. So uh, there's th there there are several uh, effects libraries like extensible effects. Uh, um, what are the other? Uh, I just uh, yesterday I learned about uh, implicit effects. Um, all of them try to solve the problem of combining side effects in a more uh, general way or more flexible way so you don't have to stack side effects upon another but have you know, but you have just a list of uh, of possible side effects for one action and you can combine them easier um, I think there there has been a lot of research in that field uh, over the last uh, couple of years um, but yes so there are probably more modern ways there are Maybe better ways depend really also depends on your application. If you only have the those two side effects you are ever going to use and you use them all the time, then maybe a mono transformer is, uh, is sufficient for you. But if you want to add to freely add or remove uh, um, certain effects, maybe from the middle of our stack, then maybe your stack isn't really the thing you want. Okay, I think that, yeah. I'd say that uh, the config following pattern is not a pattern mm -hmm. because it can be turned into a, a type class. Uh, I learned that recently mm -hmm. uh, that you can have a, a higher type configuration. Mm -hmm. I guess also a type class with a bunch of uh, uh, there's, there's a package that does the template Haskell stuff. Okay. Um, 
where you um, when you go back to your yeah. slides. Mm -hmm. I've seen that, forward. yes. Yeah. Then you mm -hmm. have the first one, is, yeah. uh, it takes the identity uh, um, contest mm -hmm. um, yeah. uh, parameter, and the second one takes the last contest mm -hmm. parameter. And then you would, your, your validate function goes then from, uh, um, yeah, it takes the, the last uh, yeah. parameter to the identity parameter. Yes. It makes uh, accessing those, those things a bit more mm -hmm. tedious. You maybe want to write lenses for that or something like this. Um, but then you can actually write a type class yeah. saying, uh, well, this is a, a, a configuration if it is of type, uh, of kind star, arrow star to star. Yeah. And uh, if it does certain things. Yeah. So, uh, but it relies on template Haskell, right? So in, uh, in general, you can write those things by yeah. hand. But yes, but then, awesome. then again, you have uh, yeah. So template Haskell is actually a very neat way to get around writing uh, a lot of design, uh, a lot of patterns. It can abstract over a lot of patterns. So uh, similarly, uh, the the um, for example, uh, um, recursion schemes require you to to write a certain. Uh, 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 trees and the corresponding tree functors, and you can also do that with template Haskell. But so, yeah, uh, it's a it's a powerful tool that uh, that is also a code solution to a problem that you would otherwise uh, do using a design pattern. More questions. Yeah, so I really enjoyed your talk. Um, uh, very helpful. Um, I'm a long-time Haskell person, not so much OO, so I actually learned more about OO than Haskell in this, <laughs> which is really helpful for me. Um, but um, one of the things that struck me is this nice place where there's some language features in the functional languages that don't show up in the object-oriented, and so you get a pattern, and, and vice versa, like mm -hmm. subtyping I thought was a good example um, of where you need to model in Haskell with some sort of structure, maybe parameterizing a type or something like that to get extensibility. And so it struck me that um, uh, I'm, I'm not sure I, I am uh, completely convinced that it's really valuable to say, is it a pattern or is it not, depending on whether it's in the language or not. Because I, I, more generally, I like to think of things as, here's a pattern. And this language happens to have it embodied mm -hmm. in the language, mm -hmm. and this language you just have to do a style of thing. But yeah. nonetheless, it's the same kind of pattern, the same kind of way of thinking about code. And so I, I like the notion of, uh, you know, if I think about something like um, fold R, for example, mm -hmm. that's, I always think of that as a pattern, except mm -hmm. there's a function, a higher order function that lets me do it. But when I'm thinking about writing a code with it, with it I think about, um, yeah, I'll need to do something like a reduce here, and just so happens that yeah. it's, mm -hmm. it's in there. So, but, but I'm thinking in terms of a, a notion of pattern, yeah. even though there's a really compact way to describe it. And so maybe we need another word that's not mm -hmm. pattern or language feature that describes how you think about the structure of, of, of doing a piece of your problem. But I mean, yeah. pattern seems to be actually be quite a good word. So I think the, the <coughs> distinction between what exactly is a design pattern or what is a, a library function is not that important, but it's uh, for or it's not that important for use. But it's certainly important when you talk about uh, when you when people between different uh, who, who have different backgrounds talk with each other. So that's why I mentioned the uh, the uh, those questions in the beginning. I get those questions a lot uh, because I work in a company with mostly object-oriented people and. I do both, uh, basically, in my work. So uh, to to make yourself uh, clear, what is a, what actually constitutes a design pattern was uh, was a pretty was the the, the step for me that uh, allowed me to uh, to explain to both groups where they where they fail to communicate. Is there a, um, a fairly comprehensive table like you sort of started coming up with, you know, visitor pattern, pattern matching, subtyping, you know, of, mm -hmm. of how to think about things in the, in the two worlds? 
something. I haven't seen one yet. I have. You um, have? <laughs> if you search for Patinopedia on GitHub, you'll find it. Patinopedia, yeah. Ah, okay, thanks. Patinopedia. How do you spell that? Patinopedia? <laughs> okay. Thank you. Simon. So, when you're um, thinking about uh, uh, patterns, when you express that in code, that usually takes the form of some kind of abstraction, mm -hmm. right? So the higher order function to abstracting another function. So a pattern that I have seen functional programmers do a lot is over abstraction. <laughs> <laughs> you see a function, it's got 17 parameters, and you have no idea what they do, and, and there's sort of there's an Edward Komet design pattern which says you can see a type and it's got a type constructor in it, with a type variable and a type class constraint that says what you need that type variable mm -hmm. to be able to do. So, but sometimes that can lead to code that's really impenetrable. Yeah. Right? Because all your types go A applied to B of C, you know, arrow to D. Um, so, so there's a balance to be struck between yeah. repeating code because it's you know concrete and perspicuous and sharing code by abstracting. I don't quite yeah. know how to, to navigate that. I, my, my, instinct, my, 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 my instinct is that on the whole, uh, the functional programmers, Haskell people in particular, tend to owe a bit too much on the side of abstraction, if anything, and make code that can be impenetrable to other people. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. But, that's, but I'm not a practitioner, and you are, yeah. so I'm wondering <laughs> whether you've come across this, or um, anybody else. So I, I think that one of, the, one of the problems is that uh, there, there are Fewer, uh, there are fewer collections of those kind of patterns in in, uh, uh, in Haskell. So one 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 thing because uh, why this uh, Daniel Four book be became so popular because uh, you you didn't have to to re reinvent a solution to a common problem anymore because there was a dictionary where you, where you could look up say, uh, say this problem okay there's this generic solution and then well, general uh, solution, and you can you just have to adapt the solution to your con concrete problem at hand. And I think we're missing that, and uh, kind of missing that in functional programming. And that's why we tend to build our own abstraction rather than looking up other people have done it this way. Let's do it the same way, and then maybe it's still kind of over abstracted in the sense that uh, it's hard to, it's kind of impenetrable, but still uh, people recognize it, can read about the pattern and then understand it because they've seen it so many times, it's, it's, uh, it's become familiar to them. Becomes even uh, becomes more and more important now that uh, Haskell is used in the industry to build, for example, web applications. If we if you don't build a web application with Haskell, then you don't need patterns for that. Um, if you if you start building uh, uh, web servers, you need something like Servant or uh, or other things, and that's also uh, when when people start to to move over from other uh, from from who, people who are used to object-oriented programming and now they start on a Haskell project and they they come with this toolbox they have for OOP and they are looking for a for a similar toolbox in Haskell they start to, to solve the same problems that's a very different setting from from where Haskell originated from uh, academia where you have uh, where the, the set of problems you solve is vastly different from the set of problems you solve in, in the in the industry. Yes. So, um, since this is a question to the audience, we can we don't have any time uh, anymore, right? But we can well, just meet here or outside in the 
and the corridor and uh, discuss this. Yes, thank you again.